and a trim tab. Thank you. Ryan. Exactly. <laughs> Thanks so much, Daniel. And see, see you guys ya. soon. Bye. Bye. All right. What a cool presentation. Next up, welcome, Avel. We have Avel Gwenin Carlu with Embedded Normativity. So thanks, Avel, to you. Hello, can you hear me? Yep. Good. And can you see the slides? Um, I only see the top left of the slide. You only see the, the top left? Yeah, just... Yeah, try again. Thank you. Okay. How about now? Yep. Looks great. Thank you. Okay, good. So, I am uh, Avelina Carlu. I'm interested in uh, multi-scale collective organization. This is why I came to Active in France to begin with. And the core question I've been asking is, um, basically, when we look at uh, Schumann's organization, there is great evolution, there is a change through time of the specific patterns that are enacted. And this is very hard to account for. And I have been uh, trying to pin down more and more specifically what exactly is going on and how to model it. So this specific work is a work I wrote uh, in the context of well, my PhD, of course, which is uh, funded by the Escape project. A project in uh, cognitive archaeology that's interesting, interested, sorry, in how uh, the culture, the um, archaeological landscape shape cognition and vice versa. The title of it is uh, Anomated Normativity, an active inference of agency, an active inference account of agency beyond flesh, because you will see very quickly why. So first, we will go through the existing work on uh, encultured cognition in the context of active in France. Then we'll try to expose the concept of embedded nativity, which we introduce here, and uh, what it means. And then we'll look at the more uh, semiotic question around the externalization and utilization of normativity in uh, cultural landscapes. So first, encultured cognition in active in France. So, we know active in France, I will go quickly over it. I still need to do it because there are onlookers that are not familiar. So active in France say that uh, agent continuously predicts the specific cues, sensory cues they will see, and they predict the action or policy they will not take. And they basically enact uh, an ongoing stream of expectation that they reconstruct given, you know, a coming signal. So this is best accounting for uh, in this uh, schema, which shows uh, the agent as the medical system, which engage through uh, environment, through action and cessations. And all of these um, specific domains, they uh, minimize a specific function that is called free energy and whose minimization basically means uh, there is a productive process going on. And a core property of active inference is that it dissolves agency as we typically understand it. We don't have agents that have like an internal monologue that drives them to take decision. We have a continuous anticipation of what's going on and whatever an agent anticipates itself to do, it will do. And so this goes for um, computationally satisfying but very deflationary notion of what is going on with agency. So the question then comes, uh, what is the relation between an agent and the cognitive landscape uh, in which it evolves? Uh, I will present very rapidly again the framework of skill and agility, uh, pioneered by Brunborg, Kivotstein, and Ridfield, uh, and which says that skill agents, which we understand as agents that understand what is going on around them, they will uh, basically experience the world as a landscape of affordances, which is opportunities for actions. And they will, their cognition pretty much reduces to the experience of this landscape and uh, adaptive engagement with it, which basically maximize the grip the agent has on the system. And essentially, for reasons we will not go over because it's math, the very uh, existence, experience of this landscape 
it is equivalent to the existence of constraints over attention, uh, the attention that the agent gives to thing, which uh, translates the embodied expectation that are, at least two-time embodied, but the embodied expectation that the agent enacts. And so this becomes very interesting when we, you know, cross it with the existence of enculturation in humans, because the basic experience we have of, of affordances, of what we can do, it is uh, shaped culturally, it is shaped by social interaction, wherein we learn uh, with other humans about what we do, when, what we can do and what we can do. And this means that uh, the basic human experience, it's uh, thoroughly encultured, it's embedded in what Ramstead called a cultural landscape, a landscape of cultural affordances, and it is embedded in um, cultural and material regimes of uh, attention, so ways to pay attention to things. And this is a figure that comes, I believe, from um, Vessier on uh, thinking through the minds, where he shows basically um, how the action and cessation cycle, when we have uh, several agents, they build a common environment that has uh, epistemic cues on how the world is like, and we, and we are enculturated to pay attention to things in a certain manner that makes it so we perceive and enact this uh, this landscape. And so the uncultured constraint over the flow of attention uh, because of the what we saw just before, the deflationary account of agency, it means that the very expense of the landscape, cultural landscape that is collectively enacted, it effectively integrates uh, intentionality and it, effective, it effectively uh, integrates normativity in a way that uh, clashes uh, strongly with classical account of both. So, given this state of the art, uh, let us look at what I mean specifically by, by embedded normativity. So, embedded normativity is a kind of normativity, I think you have, you have got it. So, normativity, it means basically the criterions by which we judge things to be good and bad. In the context of biological system, uh, they will look uh, for a specific, I don't know, chemical concentration, and they will avoid other. This is the phenomenon of chemotaxis. This is pretty basic. And this is a form of normativity. But for humans, uh, we will typically think of, you know, laws, cultural norms, um, culturally shared way to judge behavior. And again, at least in the context of law and choice theory, we typically think there is an agent, he has access to information, and we'll think, hmm, what should I do? And he will judge uh, rationally about what is good and what is bad, based on a collection of values which are internal to the agent. This is not how it works. Um, what I call embodied normativity is, by contrast, regimes of normativity, where it is the, uh, the norms and value that guide the agent's behavior, it is embedded in the material and cultural environment. So basically, the agent projects a specific set of norms and value in his, the very experience of his environment, and it will uh, perceive the locus of normativity as the uh, environment and not as a form of internal judgment. Um, let us look at what can exactly, how embedded normativity work. It will be more concrete. So uh, first, we can materially constrain people to do things. So for example, there are roads. You can go off roads, but it's harder. And you can't really do that if you have a chariot. So when you have a specific pattern of roads, which is constructed by cities, uh, you are pretty much constrained to follow the roads uh, materially. And for this, we will talk of uh, structural embedding. And there is uh, another regime of medicine normativity where we build an environment that will basically cue you, suggest you into uh, adopting specific norms and specific values. Uh, for example, escape um, thinks that vertical patterns in archaeological culture, they are somehow embedded within uh, what we'd call vertical norms. So hierarchy and certification in social relationship. And for this specific form of embedding, uh, we can talk of semantic embedding. I'm, what is must be very clear is that we don't have structural embedding on one side and semantic embedding in you know, other. There are basically two mechanisms, uh, complementary mechanisms in which uh, normative, uh, sorry, 
embedded multivity occurs. If we look at uh, CT, so this is um, impression of uh, Sumerian culture uh, city states. We have uh, matter organization that prompts specific kind of behavior. So, for example, we have a bridge, and this bridge allow you constrain you to go through the river in a specific way if you are on foot. But this material constraint, it is uh, perceivable. So by seeing the bridge, you will also see that you can navigate the world in this specific way. So you don't have a separation between semantic and structural embedding. We just have two ways in which um, constraints of our behavior that are embedded in the environment work. And something that is a core to the account of embedded normativity is again that it is not internal but we need to go into more detail uh, about what we mean by it not being internal because of course uh, we're talking about agency agents constrain what agents do it's not outside uh, what it is is um, embedded normativity is a regime of normativity where uh, the norms and value, they stem from the experience of affordance. For example, if I see a uh, fire, I will not think about, hey, could I put my hand in it and get my hand burned? Hmm, I think it would be painful. I won't do that. If I even think about putting my hand in the fire, I will immediately feel bad. The normativity is embedded in my experience of the world. I feel like the fire or more specifically the possibility of putting my hand in the fire is intrinsically bad i do not feel there is a possibility that is neutral and then i judge it to be bad but uh, of course this uh, this judgment it does not occur outside even if i feel like it's about my affordances it emerges from the engagement i have with the material and cultural niche in which i find myself and if we want to um, to untangle what this means precisely, we will have to go into more detail into the what I call the externalization and utilization of many normativity. So let us look at something very simple: how normativity work for embodied agents. So embodied agents they do things, with, hopefully, in a niche that is material, and this niche will be marked by the activity of my agent and these marks they can then act as constraints uh, either through structural or semantic embedding in the agent's environment because they basically signify that in the past i wanted to do that maybe doing that is you know good for example uh, we have centuries with i don't know if century is the english word but we have path if uh, animals that have legs this is actually important. Work, uh, sorry, walk on a specific path. They will compact the earth, and it will become improper to grow anything, even grass. And you will have a path that will emerge that are pretty neat, pretty visible, and that tell you, hey, not only this earth is compact and allow you to walk on it, like without effort, but also this has been widely judged to be um, to be a good. Uh, outline for navigation in this specific environment. So the very experience of a path basically invites you, it affords, you perceive the affordance of walking through the path. And this is something that, again, can result from your own activity that can be written into the environment by your own activity. And so this uh, begs the question of how, okay, there exists embedded normativity, but how do we embed normativity? What is the activity of embedding normativity like? And uh, the word I will use for that is externalization. We perceive the world because we externalize uh, specific causes of sensation into an imagined uh, objective external world. So when we see the path, we see a path. We do not see compact Earth that we then compute to mean that other things have worked on it. We just see, hey, there is a path. And this is because we have externalized a specific cognitive kind, which is the path. And this is an um, argument that um, several people made. Here, uh, Lena and Steiner, which if I remember well, um, worked on the um, 
the production of devices that help uh, blind people see things through, I believe, an array of repository device uh, on their shoulder. So the core argument they make is that if you give people that, they will start seeing things. They will start perceiving things as being before them rather than having vibration on the shoulder and then thinking about, oh, what does it mean? And so the uh, basic argument is that uh, perception is just a um, picture of what cause we infer, what is the structure we infer of our environment, given the existence of a specific coupling device that relates action to sensation and vice versa. And this uh, critically relies on the internalization of specific, we could say a lot of things, but I will say priors, specific priors in perception. So me seeing the path as a path relies on me having the prior knowledge that there is such a thing as path and I should be expecting to see them around. And so you have um, duality uh, of externalization and internalization in the production of embedded normativity. I can only uh, see norms out there if I've internalized, integrated a specific apparatus of perception that entails that there are indeed those specific norms that are embedded in those specific affordances. And so this uh, produces a more general question of uh, semantics, basically, of information theory. How uh, do reading and writing and reading activity works? Uh, so when I externalize, I treat the world as having specific natural categories that I pretty much imagine. And I can use them because I imagine them as an extended memory that allow me to read and write normative cues. Uh, they, this can be, um, you know, letters, uh, pure signs, but as far as I'm concerned here, all signs are at least implicitly normative there about how you should interpret the sign. And uh, this means that we can experience a specific landscape of references and we can we can write uh, things out there. We can write normative cues by our behavior that will then constrain further behavior. But nothing tells us that we can um, that we can communicate through this. In the communication it works uh, because of the internalization of priors. If a given community of agents have internalized a specific set of priors, that is a set of priors that enable externalization of normative cues, then only it can use the environment as a way to um, to write and uh, read normative cues as a embedded normativity thing. And this communication, it can be read in terms of uh, information theory, of course, it can be read in terms of semantics. But what is uh, critical to analyze that the process of intellectualization, it is there, there is no um, trust system there is no uh, private key that allow you to be sure that the way you internalize norms is very specifically uh, the way in which the embedded nativity was encoded to begin with there is a loss or there is ambiguity or there is i'd rather say it like this an active demarch of reconstruction of given priors by the agent and so this gap between the intent of other communicants and my intent, my understanding of what they meant by their active engagement, active engagement with the world, it builds a tiny gap in information that is somehow enough to drive the open-ended evolution of cultural landscape. And this is something that I do not think is embedded in active in France, and I think is of major interest to research to the research, at least in the evolution of uh, open-ended evolution of cultural landscape. So, uh, to sum up things, uh, I just presented a paper that is called Anomalous Normativity, and that speaks unsurprisingly of, embe of embedded normativity. Uh, first major point is that if active inference is correct, then um, our notion of agency is dissolved essentially in the notion that we can perceive and enact cognitive landscape, uh, umwelt, if you want. And given uh, that this is the case, we will experience the norms and value that guide our behavior as a property of, you know, the cognitive landscape we experience, the affordance that we can perceive. And this specific 
regime of normativity, I call embedded normativity. And the third thing is that you have a critical thing going on, you have a semiotically constraining thing going on in the externalization and internalization of regimes of embedded normativity. Because uh, those two things, they respectively enable normat embedded normativity to exist, to have a causal power, and they enable also the open-ended evolution of the norms that are embedded in a given landscape, in a given material landscape. And therefore, the open-ended evolution of the um, associated cultural or cognitive landscape. So, thank you. I will uh, unroll my uh, references slides in case someone has the really needs to know what the reference is and is ready to move around the video for this. And do you have questions? Awesome. Thank you, Avel. While people are typing any questions, could you maybe just give a little introduction to the active inference for the social sciences course? Like what brought you to want to facilitate this effort and where are we at and where do you want it to go? What do you want it to be for people? Oh, unmute and then continue. Good point. Thank you. Uh, the Active Inference Institute organizes uh, and Kairos Research organize a course on the on Active Inference in the social science that is uh, based essentially in explaining the um, basic demarche, the basic hypothesis, and the uh, consequences of the cultural landscape formalism that I hinted at slightly in this presentation. Uh, the goal of the course is to give a basic ontology that is an in interface between complexity science, let us say physics written large, uh, cognitive science and social science to uh, afford interdisciplinary collaboration in the um, in the social science and in the study of the evolution of human societies. And I think it is cool. But I'm biased because I organized it. So maybe you should ask Daniel, which is absolutely biased, whether the course is cool. I, I've been enjoying it a lot. Uh, we just finished last week with my section on collective behavior. First, we had the introduction lecture from you, then Ben White on the basics of being an active agent. And we have Lorena and Mao's sections upcoming as well as your more dedicated session. Yeah, it's been a really fun uh, experience and it's going to provide a really useful missing piece in the ecosystem. I guess just one question I have, how, how do we take some of these topics you're bringing in about the embedded normativities and think about them digitally? Like, are we talking about conceptual embeddedness in information environments? And or are we talking about the ergonomics of sitting at our desk? Or how do we bring that kind of pleasure path, stigmergy, on the ground into the digital? Are we talking about something that's embodied and embedded in the information space? Or are we still talking about bodies? So if we talk uh, about humans, we talk about bodies with the brain it's that do things in a material environment. But like, your question is, uh, I'm not sure I understood this, how can we bring this specific concept in the study of digital phenomena, like uh, Twitter, internet? Yeah. Is that it? Yeah. Okay. So you have basically the whole study on the uh, affordances. You have a, so the uh, discipline of design has uh, incorporated a while ago the notion of affordance in its uh, structure. And most of the study in the digital design centered on what uh, platforms afford or do not afford. And you have a richer stance when you take into account not what you can do with a specific interface, but what the specific interface invites you to do, given a set of cultural written large. Uh, it can be uh, self-learning. But given a set of power that you share with, uh, with the um, platform in a way that is uh, formal but indirect and um so yes i would look at it in terms of in, uh, user interface design 
I think this concept specifically is useful for um, for interface design. Uh, then you have implicitly the question of um, the flow that uh, platforms such as I don't know uh, Twitter, Facebook, um, how specific uh, structural environments bring specific collective dynamics that might be a bit um, richer, not richer specifically, but that might go in a direction that the user interface question do not go into. And that can still be modeled in terms of uh, constraints and therefore in, in terms of uh, embedded normativity. Is that uh, on point with we'll the question? Hmm. Yeah, that's interesting about what the interface does and then what it invites. It might invite things in order for that invitation to be fulfilled, it has to actually provide that possibility. But it might invite things that that aren't relationally possible like there might be a wall which invites climbing to a given observer yet they cannot climb it um and then on the other side is a capacity that isn't invited and that is the the adjacent possible of tool use where something that was being used for this purpose it's like all of a sudden it just fell out of someone's hand they grasped it a different way it invited a different engagement and then that can become re-entrenched and that points to that sequential like making and breaking of new spaces that your work has featured over the last few years yes exactly this work has been developed with uh while thinking about tool use while thinking about uh, cognitive archaeology while thinking about um the experience of uh, cities, the way urbanism uh, prompts specific behavior. Uh, but um, if I can get back on the internet thing, I'd like to make it more specific. So the interface design, as far as I know, is focused on interface. That is, that is not surprising. Uh, but in doing so, it is uh, focused on specific affordance and what you can do. Uh, you have another layer in uh, ecological psychology, which is the layer of uh, solicitation. So for example, Twitter does something very specific, which is when you log in, it, show you, it uh, shows you the number of notification you have. Then it removes it. And you have to wait to know which were those uh, notification. And you have to wait, not one second, not one minute, but a random amount of time. So this is uh, what they call dark patterns. They are patterns in design that are explicitly designed to create addiction. So this is a layer you can't afford in affordance because, uh, yeah, from an affordance perspective, there is just a moment you can access the information and then a moment you can't, and then the moment you can again. There is nothing going on. If you don't look at interesting motivation and the way a specific structural environment is perceived, the semiotics, semantics maybe, the meaning that a uh, given landscape has for an agent. And even if you look at this, you are sti still looking at the platform in a way that is, um, is embedded from the specific patterns, that specific patterns of things that people do on the platform. If you have Twitter without the aggressive uh, QRTs and the um, way to aggressively signal that you are in whatever it is, is going on, you don't have Twitter much, you have Mastodon, maybe that has very similar affordances and very, very, very dissimilar solicitation. So this is this is why you have to, to take a multi-scale account of things. And when you take a multi-scale account of things, you have to look at the semiotics, basically of behavior, how specific coordination occur at specific scales around specific uh, communication, specific message passing. And once you look at how specific message become meaningful to specific agent, you are you, you have a problem basically because this is subjective, this is constructed through the activity of the agent, and this is uh, whatever is the range of time you are looking at, you will have the construction of new possibilities of adjacent possibles, as you put it. And yeah, this is the this is the. Uh, big question that I think we are missing at the moment in Active Inference. Awesome. Well, thank you for this presentation. Thanks for the social sciences work. And we're all looking forward to seeing how the projects play out. Thank you. Goodbye.
very well have all right the 